Hosea was called by God to a very, very difficult task. He was the prophet that was called and instructed to illustrate the concept of redemption. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We praise you for who you are. And we come to your word tonight with humble hearts who are thirsty and hungry for more of you. And so we ask for our daily bread. We ask that you would use this time to grow our faith and to strengthen our hearts to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, you do want to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at um, the first half of verse 7. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, the first half of verse 7. You're, you're also going to want to turn to the book of Hosea. So have one finger in Ephesians and one finger in the book of Hosea. Uh, we'll be looking at both of these, uh, both of these things tonight. Uh, as we've seen so far in our studies of the book of Ephesians, our salvation is Trinitarian in nature. That is, the Father has a role, the Son has a role, the Holy Spirit has a role. And that's what Paul is showing us in the first 14 verses of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Each of the roles carried forth by each of the respective persons of the Trinity is a separate and distinct role from the roles of the others, and yet they all work together. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together to accomplish one thing, and that is the will of God being actually, not just potentially, but actually accomplished. It isn't that it's just a possibility that God's will will be done. It's not as if there's even a chance of it failing. It's not that, uh, that this is something that would be fallible, like it's an ideal that may or may not happen. No, it will be accomplished. God's will cannot be thwarted. His will shall be done. Now, we, we've seen that part of His sovereign will is to save sinners. And to that end, we saw in verses 4 to 6 the role that the Father plays in our salvation. We saw that He elects a people unto salvation. Before the foundation of the world, Paul tells us in verse 4, God the Father chose us, chose the elect, to be holy and blameless before Him, predestining us for adoption as sons and daughters through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of His will. That is His will for us. And this is the role of the Father. His role was to elect a people unto salvation in Christ. And as we continue looking at one of the most amazing and most beautiful and most glorious doxological statements in all of Scripture, we'll now examine the role that the Son plays in our salvation. And we're seeing the blessings that we have in Christ because of what Christ has done. And it might seem that God could simply say unto the elect, I forgive you. Just forget about it and we'll just pretend it never happened and just let it be that. He could just turn a blind eye. It seems that it would just be that simple. And yet, not a single one of us can imagine a judge doing that to a habitual criminal. All sin demands that a full dose of God's wrath be poured out against sin, the smallest and, of course, the greatest. And because God is perfectly just, indeed, you know, it's, it's only because God is just that we consider justice to be a good thing. That, that's a reflection of God's nature, His law written on our hearts. Because God is perfectly just, He can't just turn a blind eye to sin. Sin requires a payment. It incurs a debt. So there aren't a ton of options here. Either you have to bear 
your, the wrath of God against your sin, or someone else who doesn't already have a sin debt of their own would have to stand in your place as your substitute. And this brings us to the role of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ in our salvation. The Father elects us for adoption, and we will now start seeing the role and the blessings of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our salvation. So we start with verse 7, and we're just going to be looking at eight words tonight. In Him, we have the redemption. We have redemption through His blood. And as we read this, the first thing we'd better do is figure out who the pronoun him refers to. And this forces us to to look backward in our text to find the most immediate proper noun in order to connect that to this this pronoun. And in this case, we don't have to go too far. It's found at the end of verse 6. The one referred to as as him in verse 7 is the one referred to as the beloved in verse 6. And given the context, we know that this refers to the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember that the point of this entire passage is to see the blessings that God has given to us. Election is a blessing from the Father, as is adoption. Those are blessings that were ordained by God, the Father, from eternity past. And yet look at the tense here in verse 7. It says, we have. It says, in him we have. It's present tense. But it's not just present. This is one of those things that we miss in English. It's not just present tense. The Greek tense actually indicates that it's a present reality. And not only is it a present reality, but it's a reality in the present that extends into the, uh, the future. It's a, it's a continuing reality. So it's not that redemption was accomplished and its effects don't reach into the present and don't reach into the future. And it's not that we need to wait for redemption as if it's going to come at a later time. No, it's accomplished. We have it. We don't have to wait for it. This this is a blessing that we have right now. It's a present reality for all who are in Christ Jesus. From eternity, the Father planned the salvation of the elect. To that end, The Son was incarnate. He took on flesh, never once sinning, upholding all the demands of the law in all perfection, and dying in the place of the elect. Redemption. He redeemed those whom the Father elected. He redeemed those whom the Father gave to Him. Now, if you were to look up the word redemption in the dictionary, you'd get something like this. The act of atoning for a fault or mistake, or to deliver, to rescue. Biblically, yes, redemption is these things. But it's more than that in, uh, in, biblical, uh, in, in the biblical understanding of it. Redemption in the Bible refers to the payment of a ransom, the payment of a price. The Greek word that Paul uses really means a, release, a releasing affected by payment or ransom, or the act of paying a ransom in full. That's what it means to be redeemed. When Paul says that in him we have redemption. Now some might say that the overarching theme of the Bible is redemption. It's not. That might surprise you, but redemption is not the overarching primary theme of Scripture. We've already seen that redemption is actually a means to an end. That being, as Paul said in verse 6, the praise of His glorious grace. So the glory of God. The glory of God is the primary overarching theme of Scripture. And redemption is a means toward that end. It's It's a theme that does run throughout Scripture, but it's a means to an end. The end being the salvation of the elect, and the glory of God through that. Now, if you were to look at the ways that the concept of redemption is found in the Bible, you could start in the Old Testament, and you'd see that it applies to firstborn males of a household. Uh, It's applied to land. Uh, But of great significance in our instance is the fact that the term redemption was also applied to slaves, 
Listen to what Leviticus chapter 25, verses 47 to 49 says. It says, If a stranger or a sojourner with you becomes rich, and your brother beside him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner with you, or to a member of the stranger's clan, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him, or an uncle or his cousin may redeem him, or a close relative from his clan may redeem him, or if he grows rich, he may redeem himself. And you might say, why is that significant for us? It's significant because every single one of us was born into a slavery that's worse than any slavery that the world has ever known, and that is spiritual slavery. At one point in his earthly ministry, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So who practices sin? Everyone. Everyone does. Scripture is clear that this is our status from the moment that we're even conceived. We are slaves to sin by nature, by nature and by choice, and we are unable to free ourselves. We're unable to ransom ourselves. We're unable to redeem ourselves. The debt is simply more than we can pay. The debt is an eternity's worth of God's wrath against sin. God often used his prophets in the Old Testament to give shocking, sometimes kind of revolting, sometimes kind of insane uh, object lessons to his people. Visual messages, visual pictures of of the message that the prophets were to deliver. For example, if, if you know about Ezekiel, Ezekiel was instructed to lay on his side for 390 days, baking his bed or baking his bread over human excrement to warn the Israelites that this is how they'd have to eat their bread when God drove the nations around them in to overtake them. And then, of course, after pleading with God, please don't make me do this, God does uh, allow him to bake his bread on cow dung instead. But what a a difficult and, and revolting thing for Ezekiel to be instructed directly by God to do, right? I mean, that's... That's an awful thing to have to do. But it was an awful and also glorious thing to be called to the office of prophet. And Hosea was no exception. Hosea was called by God to a very, very difficult task. To give a picture of the message that God wants to send, wanted to send to his people. He was the prophet that was called and instructed to illustrate the concept of redemption in a story that is really kind of heartbreaking, but it's also beautiful. The story starts with God calling Hosea to the office of prophet. If you have your Bible with you, Hosea Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say this, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So already, two verses in, and you get this idea that, wow, this is something that's going to be kind of emotionally charged. Hosea's life belonged to the Lord because the Lord had called him. God was the one who was was calling the shots in his life. And Hosea was instructed to marry a wife, marry a woman who was a harlot. Maybe she was a prostitute doing what she did for money, or maybe she was just sexually promiscuous, to say it as nicely as we possibly can. She was an adulteress. Now we know that adultery is a sin. We know that the law condemns adultery. It's condemned by God. And we know that under the law of Moses, it was worthy, it was punishable by capital punishment. But maybe most importantly, we should remember that adultery is likened to unfaithfulness to God. 
Adultery is a type of illustration for spiritual unfaithfulness. And so God instructs His prophet Hosea to marry this woman who is sexually promiscuous because God wants the Israelite people to see a picture of His relationship to them. Hosea would represent God as the faithful, loving, patient husband. And Hosea's wife, her name would be Gomer, she would be a picture of the spiritual unfaithfulness of Israel. Look at verse 3. Hosea chapter 1, verse 3. So he, Hosea, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. As I, as I think about this, as I think about what Hosea is being told and what he's being called to, he had to know that this was going to be such a difficult task. And yet the indication is that he immediately, one verse later, immediately he obeys exactly what God told him to do. He takes this woman, Gomer, as his wife, and it's not long before she conceives of a son. And this would ordinarily be something that would bring you great joy, but look what God says in verses 4 and 5. It says, And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So God instructs Hosea to name his son Jezreel, which means God sows. See, Jezreel, which, by the way, almost sounds like Israel. The the J's in Hebrew are actually pronounced with a a Y, so it would be Jezreel. Jezreel was a city where King Ahab had his palace. It was uh, was a place of, of great military strength. And so this child's name was going to be a warning that God was going to break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. That is, He was going to render them unable to defend themselves or to fight. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 tells us, She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy or Lo Ruhamah. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. The fact that for all these years, Israel had been so unfaithful to God and yet continued to flourish, continued to even exist as a people. That was all mercy. The fact that they were allowed to even continue being called God's people. That was all mercy mercy. God wasn't giving them what they had earned for themselves with their spiritual unfaithfulness. But the time of showing them mercy and patience was coming to an end. Verses 8 and 9 say, when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. Lo Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. The indication then is that this was a child that was not Hosea's. This was a child that was conceived and and fathered by another man. If you turn to chapter 2 and look at verse 5, you read this. For their mother has played the whore. She has conceived, she who has conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. This was the condition of Israel at the time of Hosea. But it's, in a sense, it's also the condition of all people. By nature. By nature, we we pursue the desires of the flesh rather than seeking God. This is where every Christian starts. Ephesians chapter 2, we were born children of, of wrath. We, we all sinned. We, we were sinners by, by nature, and we're sinners by choice. We were all spiritual adulterers. We all deserved nothing but wrath, and were indeed children of wrath. 
Gomer would continue to chase after these men, to chase after these, these lovers. And Hosea just let her go. He let her do it. And all the while, he was providing for her needs. And she didn't even know it. He was, he was providing for her, and she, she didn't even recognize it. Eventually, she would lose absolutely everything. She'd run out of lovers. Nobody would want her. She'd be a woman that was just kind of on her own, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with her. No man, that is, except Hosea. And so eventually, she ends up with nothing. Naked, being sold as a slave. And she goes up for sale. And we read in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. So what did Hosea end up doing? He redeemed her. He purchased her. He he paid a price to take possession of her and to have rights to her. And this is what Christ has done for us. He did it not with a mere 15 shekels, that's 15 days worth of wages, but with His own blood. We were all slaves to sin. It owned us. It dictated our actions. And it was a cruel and relentless master and we served it gladly. But Christ shed His blood to redeem us, to ransom us, to rescue us. Did He redeem everyone? You'll find people who say that He did, In his letter to to Timothy, Paul said, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So you see where that word all uh, could lead some people to think that everybody is redeemed. And yet I have to caution you, uh, when you come to the word all in Greek, you should be very, very careful because that word uh, can be used very loosely if you consider Romans chapter 5. So the question that we should be asking is, does all refer to all of humanity or all what? And we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So we should start off by remembering what Jesus said. Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. For many. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 say, You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So when we read that, we have to think, okay, who, who is Peter writing to? Who, whom is he addressing? The church. He's addressing Christians. So we should understand, based on Scripture's clear testimony throughout, that when Paul says all, he's referring to all of the elect. It's all of a certain people group. It's the church who is ransomed, redeemed, rescued by the blood of Christ. We are the many whom Jesus was referring to. Redemption is found only in Christ. And there is no redemption outside of Christ. He purchased us. He paid for us with His own blood. But you must ask the question, what exactly has He redeemed us from? Many people live their lives as if all Jesus did was save us from God's wrath. As if that's such a small thing, right? It's not. It's huge, right? He did that. Jesus did redeem us from the wrath of God. He redeemed us from the penalty of sin. But He did more than that. He redeemed us not only from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. Sin, if you are in Christ, sin, because you have been redeemed by Christ, is no longer your master. 
It no longer has a right to dictate your actions. Christ is your master. Christ is your Lord. You have no further obligation to sin. We have new nature, a new nature in Christ. The old has come. The old is gone. The new has come. We're a new creation. You are freed from enslavement to sin. And so I end by asking you this. Does that shape your life? Do you live in light of this amazing truth that Christ has not only redeemed you from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin? The implication is that Christ, and Christ alone, is now your master. He's the one who owns you. He's the one who has the authority to inform every single decision you make. He's redeemed you, and you belong to Him. You don't belong to yourself. You don't have the authority to call the shots in your life. Only Christ does. And His Lordship over you should change absolutely everything about the way you see yourself and about the way that you respond to Him. This redemption that we have in Christ is one of the great, great heavenly blessings that we see in these first 14 verses of chapter 1 of Ephesians. By the grace of God who continues to strengthen us, who continues to sustain us, who grows us, who nurtures us, who provides for us. May our lives reflect this reality, that Christ is our Redeemer, so that Christ would be glorified in our lives. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the work that Christ did to redeem us. Thank you, Father, for these great truths from Ephesians chapter 1. And we pray, Lord, that as we consider the great cost of redemption, that it would change our lives, that it would change our perspective, and that it would inspire us and motivate us to live lives that are pleasing to you for the glory of Christ. Amen. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.